comments and all. <laughs> all right. Good luck for your uh, result. Thank you. So uh, let's start um, the session. I welcome you all from the uh, med exam. Um, today we will be talking about uh, the module of uh, core surgical skills. So in the core surgical skills, most, most of the stations, um, they will be either be those where there is a complication, a post-op complication. For example, a post-op hematoma, ureteric injury, bowel injury, or um, like the, all the stations where you need to um, do uh, perform the duty of condor and do some risk management, address the risk management issues. And um, this is where all you need to do is to um, uh, control the patient because the patient is going to be very angry with the complications. So you need to know how to deal with such patients. Um, in such stations, um, because from the start of this patient, station, the patient is very angry. So first thing first is to uh, make the patient calm down a little bit so that you can uh, start and move further with the uh, consultation. So um, the patient is very angry. She starts shouting at you that what you have done um, and I'm having all this pain or any symptoms that patient is coming in with. Uh, if the patient has vomiting, any uh, pain, first of all, you need to settle the symptoms. Uh, give some pain relief, give some um, anti-sickness medication, antiemetics, uh, give some fluids, and then uh, address the risk management issues, perform the duty of condor. So what you can say is that um, I can see uh, that you are angry and um, uh, 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 unfortunately, um, the um, care that you have received did not meet your expectation. Uh, and unfortunately, a complication has happened. Then you will explain the complication, what, whatever the complication has happened. And then you say that the patient is still angry. And you can say that we, we have already set up an um, uh, investigation. And we will look into, into the matter as to where things went wrong and what could have been done differently to avoid this. And um, uh, if you, uh, we call it as incident reporting, and um, if you are, you still want to make a complaint, I'll connect you to a patient advisory and liaison services where you can formally lodge your complaint. So this is how these are, you have to cram up these lines in the exam. So uh, from the start of this session, you just um, have to say these lines and the patient will automatically will, will be calmed down and then you can um, move forward with your um, a consultation. Then the other type of stations in the core surgical skills will be um, uh, some elective stations where you have to uh, take uh, the consent. Um, in the consent uh, stations, mostly patient will be uh, like, like patient, you can uh, communicate easily with the patient and you'll have to take the consent. Um, and then there, there are some uh, other type of stations where you have a, a structured discussion or a viva with the examination. Uh, these can be either be laparoscopy, hysteroscopy stations, then um, enhanced recovery program, diathermy. These are some of the interactive stations. So uh, today we will be talking about laparoscopy because there is an exam station which is coming again and again in the exam, um, a structured viva with the examiner. So um, in the surgical module, um, if it is a um, SPT station, uh, you will have to do an introduction, agenda making. In case of emergency and complication, we'll settle the patient's complaint of pain or vomiting by giving some pain relief antiemetics. Uh, then once the patient is calmed down, then you can talk about uh, to say that, um, take the history of presenting illness. Uh, the first question has to be an open question. So you all you can say that, tell me more about what happened after the surgery. And she will uh, tell you about the sequence of events which happened after the surgery and led to the condition. Um, then um, uh, her active complaints, for example, it is pain, then you have to take a detailed history of the pain. Where exactly is the pain since when you have the pain? What is the character of pain? Uh, is it going anywhere else in your tummy? Any vomiting or bleeding with it? Uh, has, has any treatment been given to you? How was the, um, uh, since when you have this pain, has it changed? Uh, and then any exacerbating relieving factors and severity. How bad is, is the pain on a score of uh, 1 to 10? Then you would also like to know about the details of the surgery. Why the surgery happened, for example, it was an um, laparoscopic cystectomy. Then you can uh, ask a little bit history about since when you were diagnosed to have uh, the cyst, 
and a, li a little bit information the patient will automatically give you. Uh, then uh, we'll complete the rest of the template obstetric. If the patient is in emergency, then we will uh, squeeze it a little bit. So in the emergency, you don't need to go uh, too much deep, but obviously uh, obstetric history is important because um, you would like to know about the mode of delivery. If it is a previous surgery, then uh, that is also a risk factor. Then in the gynecological history, LMP is very important in all surgical uh, stations. Cyclicity, uh, you can ask this uh, for patients who have um, uh, who are in the elective clinic or in the clinic. Otherwise, for the emergency patient, you don't need to know uh, about the cycle. Uh, contraception, um, because the patient might, might be using OCPs. So or any OCPs or HRD, they need to, to be stopped uh, prior to the surgery. Um, uh, you can also ask about the cervical screening in the clinic patients, then complete the rest of the template in terms of medical history, any past surgical history, family history, any uh, drugs, for example, anticoagulants that the patient might be on because they need to be stopped as well prior to the surgery. Uh, then we would like to know about uh, allergies to any medication, to latex. The personal history, BMI is very important. Our blood group will rule out the Jehovah's Witness. Uh, uh, smoking history, drinking, social history, because post-operatively, uh, the patient will need um, post-op care and support. So the family support is very important in this aspect as well. So uh, uh, all the patient safety points, I have highlighted them here um, uh, in the uh, red color. Uh, then we will take the examination, um, do the examination and uh, um, would like to know about the investigation. So in all the surgical modules, um, uh, in the emergency situation, BBN is very important, breaking bad news, performing the duty of condor. These are the patient safety points, explaining the uh, complication, incident reporting. So, uh, and in all these patients, first of all, you will have to do some emergency treatment in terms of giving some fluids, pain relief, um, taking some bloods to do some investigation. And then the subsequent management, then you will say that I would like to inform my consultant and then the consultant will come. And uh, I'm afraid that we'll have to go back again to the theater to perform another surgery in order to rectify things. So these uh, tram up these lines and in all the complication patients, mostly these are the bowel injury, vest, uh, uh, the hematoma patients, and then ureteric injury. So all in all these patients, the management is almost the same. There's nothing different that you need to tell or um, uh, know. Like these are the simple things which you need to say, and then your station will be complete. And the subsequent management then will be um, uh, second surgery and then post-operative care don't forget about that as well so in the post-operative care we'll um, keep a close eye on your heart rate on your blood pressure we'll, um, uh, give you some pain relief some um, medication to prevent infection and then also um, uh, thromboprophylaxis is very important so medication to avoid blood clots if you are in, in the emergency situation, do not leave the patient. And uh, the closing of the station should be that I'm right here uh, to look after you. Okay, so don't, do not leave the patient in such stations. So am I being clear so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, let's move to the laparoscopy. So in the laparoscopy, um, first of all, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about the instruments. Although in the exam, uh, they are not going to ask you, but we need to know a little bit about the basics. So that in the exam, when they ask us questions, we are not blank, okay? So uh, in the laparoscopy, first of all, we have a laparoscopy tower in which we have got, um, uh, there is uh, from the, if you start from the bottom, there will be uh, a printer, a medical grade printer. Uh, then there is a light source. Then there is a video capture unit. So it captures the image from the digital camera and it stores the image as well. And then there is an insufflator. And then there is also, as you can see in this image that there is a carbon dioxide cylinder as well. So uh, this is the, um, laparoscopy tower and then there are two monitors in some simple towers there can be one monitor but in the um, more advanced ones there are two uh, two monitors one for the first assistant uh, for the surgeon and the second one is for the first assistant 
then comes the um, instrument which are needed for the bottom end so for the bottom end first of all we need um, sims peglum to retract the posterior vaginal wall then uh, we will need we uh, will be needing some swabs which are mounted on the uh, sponge holding forceps uh, to uh, for <clears throat> prepping the vagina then we can use either tenaculum or valsalams to hold the interior lip of the cervix then uh, we have got a uterine man manipulator this manipulator is used to anti-vert or retrovert the uterus during the procedure and uh, we will be needing a um, uterine sound this is to assess the length of the uterus as well as to see the direction as whether it is anti-verted or retroverted. And then we have an in and out catheter. Okay, so these are some of the instruments which are needed for the uh, bottom end. For the, then we have got the laparoscopy tray. So in the laparoscopy tray, we have got um, uh, a 10 mm laparoscope and um, it has a, a light lead. And this light lead is attached here to the laparoscope and the other end, it will be connected to the uh, to the light source on the laparoscopy tower. All right. And then uh, we have got this gas tubing. So one end of the gas tubing goes to the various needle and the other end goes to the insufflator. Insufflator, which is uh, there on the laparoscopy tower. And then we have got some uh, trocars. So we have got 5 mm trocars and the 10 mm trocars. Usually for the umbilical uh, entry, the 10 mm trocar is used. Uh, and um, when we are using for this as a secondary ports, uh, then we can use these 5 mm ports. Also for the Palmer's point entry, 5 mm ports are used. So uh, these are some of the, um, some of the, some basic instruments of the laparoscopy. Uh, am I being clear so far? about the instruments? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now we will discuss one of the exam stations. And for this, I need a volunteer. So who would like to volunteer for this station? Do we have any volunteers? Anam, are you there? Would you like to take the station? <laughs> okay, okay, take that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just give it a try, okay? okay? Because this is not exam. We are just doing preparation. So it's okay yeah. to make mistakes now, okay? Uh, so uh, you can uh, read the station and then uh, I'll give you two minutes. Um, I think one minute should be enough because there's nothing much in this um, in candidate instructions, okay? And then we'll start the station. I'll give you 10 minutes in which you will answer the questions. Okay, so that is a structured discussion. Yeah, it yeah. It is a structured fine. discussion, yes. And even if you don't complete in 10 minutes, it should be fine because I have got some like more questions than the examiner would do. Okay. Okay, okay, doctor. So your one minute starts now. So uh, I'm uh, Dr. Alam for today exam niche for today exam. So I'm re I read the uh, questions, so I'm ready for discussion. Okay. So, Anam, would, what further information would you like to know about this patient? So, uh, I would like to know about uh, the durations of the pain, if it's affected quality of the life, the site of the pain, uh, the radiations, any aggravating relieving factor, um, any medications was used, as mentioned, that uh, so from from the history the patient has the pain for five years how to affect the quality of the life to affect her psychology or affect her job or uh, daily activity or if uh, she sexual activity affect her sexual mm -hmm. life um and uh, also <clears throat> uh, if it's intermittent pain or if it's continuous pain if it's any relieving factor of that pain or um, exaggerated factor with that pain, there is any bowel urinary symptoms. Um, okay. uh, uh, and also I want to, uh, I, I know um, details history about her menstrual cycle, whether this pain is related to the menstrual cycle or it's related to the sexual uh, intercourse. And also uh, the last menstrual period, I want to know about her, about, uh, <clears throat> and also about uh, menses, I, if there is any uh, dysmenorrhea or, mm -hmm. or if there is any intermenstrual bleeding or anything related to her. Uh, and if she received any contraceptions, uh, mm -hmm. apart from, I mean, apart from for treatment of her pain and, um, 
And also, I would, I would like, um, uh, she's 27, so I will ask her about uh, if she's uh, up to date with her pap smear. If there is any history of sexual transmitted infection, so important. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, if, um, if she, also it's very important about this, uh, I mean, if she's feeling of depressed or any psychological problem with is complaining of it during this uh, time of pain or preceding the pain. She is also 27 years. I would like to ask if she has any sexual assault uh, in her life. Very good. So. Okay, is that all? Or history, yeah. As if there is any medical illness apart from this chronic pelvic pain, if there is any medication, mm -hmm. allergy, uh, Very good. for me, is blood groups okay? I'll ask her about blood group if, uh, mm -hmm. if we'll go for further investigations or we'll go for laparoscope. So I prefer to ask her if she is to have witness also about uh, so body mass index was written here. It says she is on low side, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's below the average for her body mass index. Um, and also, but about any surgical history, if she has any surgical history. Very good, yeah. Uh, because it's interfered with any further in, in, uh, treatment and investigations. And uh, also, in, I, I ask about if she has any history of sexual transmitted infection. If, if there is, uh, if it's treated or not treated, if uh, there is follow up, if she has any sexual transmitted infection. Uh, uh, and the sexual activity also, as, uh, it may be, I will ask her something, if she is now, uh, I mean, if she is sexually active, I will ask her if how long she has been sexually active with such partner. Uh, I mean, if she's, uh, if she has previous sexual partner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so family history, I don't think it's significant. Yeah, but it maybe I, I'll ask her if there is any social support uh, surrounding her. Yeah. Good. And uh, would you like to know about the examination and any yeah. investigations? Yeah, I would like to examine her. So, so for vital signs, we'll exam ask the nurse to examine her for vital signs. But for general examination also, I will ask uh, examine her. Body mass index is look 18. So I will examine her tummy first. Uh, and then if there's any scar in her tummy, if there's any distension or it's is just normal examination, the abdominal examination. And then I will examine her after her permission in the presence of chaperone, I will uh, ask her for a vaginal examination. This is include inspection. I mean, uh, inspections of the vulva and also speculum examinations for inspection of the cervix and uh, for vagina, and then by manual examinations. After I, uh, before that, I will ask her to empty her bladder. And then I will examine her by manual examinations will include for examination for the size of the uterus, uh, if there is any, in direction, mobility, there is any tenderness. Uh, I will examine the both adnexia to look for any tenderness or any mass in the adnexia. Also, I will examine her pouch, posterior pouch of the gloss for any uh, tethering or if there is any injuration in the posterior uh, vaginal wall. Okay. So, yeah. so uh, what um, you are now seeing the patient in the preoperative clinic? Yeah. three days before the surgery. So what my years will be taken in the pre-op clinic? Yes, measure. So it will be, um, it will be investigation first. I will do investigations. Um, Doctor, can I see the question, please? Yeah. So what yes. measures will be taken in the pre-operative clinic? <clears throat> okay. So, so consent should be taken, written consent. But uh, yeah, um, very good. So uh, I will uh, do also a WHO checklist for written consent. And it's, it's uh, first, it's, uh, I will put in my mind enhanced recovery program and also WHO checklist. This is at the time previous the surgery. It's maybe day one or at the same time of surgery. But if, if three days before the surgery should be full investigation done. And yeah. um, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe simple like urine examination, CPC, blood group. If there yeah, is no yeah. other abnormality, no need. And she's young, 27 years. Um, okay. uh, for me, I will do. Uh, I will send her also for ultrasounds, just in case to check if there is any. Uh, in spite of uh, abdominal examinations, pelvic examinations look normal, but sometimes I need ultrasounds to detect if there is. Uh, she's she is low body mass index, so it's just easy to examine her uh, by vag abdominal vaginal examination. It could okay. be a possibility I will do transvaginal ultrasounds. Okay. So now the patient uh, is in theater. She is intubated. 
and what measures will you take just before the surgery? So uh, before the surgery, I will examine the patients also under, if she is now under GA, so in, in the table, the suvine position, I will examine the abdomen just, and I will uh, examine the skin for any mobility. I mean, yeah. So I will examine the abdomen for any mass, any palpable mass, and also I will examine the mobility of the anterior abdominal wall. Okay. Is it all? For examinations, I will check all the instruments. Uh, I will allow them to check all the instruments for laparoscopes if it's okay, if there is any setup, and then we can start uh, the procedure. Do you want me to start the procedure, doctor? Yeah. So how will you proceed with the laparoscopy considering the risk factors in your patient? Yeah. So it's because my patient is low body mass index, so it's high risk for laparoscope. Uh, so okay. and these conditions, yeah, um, uh, it, it through the sub umbilicals, it's more risky if it's a blind procedure. So either mm -hmm. I will go for open procedure. It's a more senior one. We'll do for it. It should be for okay. this patient, and um, and then either or I will use Balmer point technique because it will Very be good. avoid the yeah the avoid the trauma to the vascular injury below the umbilicals. Yes. Oh so, yeah. So this is the major point. If I will go straight forward, and then after that, when we introduce the barras needle, I will check. Uh, I will check. first. I will check the uh, spring of the barras needle if it's working, and then I will introduce the barras needle. Um, I will use Balmar, or either use the open technique, different from closed technique. And then after that, I will check that uh, the barras needle, if it's palmar technique, I will check if it's, it's in, in the peritoneal cavity, either by different technique, I spray it, use five cc aspirations needle. So mm -hmm. I will then spray it if there is nothing and then inject normal saline and go freely. And then I will aspirate it again if there is nothing. So it will be in the abdominal cavity. Uh, after that, we'll put the gas. First, I will check the gas. Uh, uh, I mean, check flow of the gas is oh, it's, it's okay, and then I will put the gas. So I will increase the pressure till uh, 20 to 25 millimeter yes. mercury. So after that, I will remove the varus needle, mm -hmm. and then I will introduce the trocar. It should be under precaution, but now it's it's, uh, it's if abdomen uh, distended, yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's depend for this patient. Some of them they use 10 millimeter. Some of them they use five because it's thin patient. Uh, so it will be introduced the first trocar, and then in, after a direct vision, we'll introduce the uh, accessory trocar, lateral trocar. It may be only one trocar will induce this patient only for, because when we take the consent of the patient, so we should take the written consent of the patient for diagnostic laparoscope. But maybe we add something for the uh, written consent to be taken if there is any pathology identified. It could be removed at the same time or, uh, well, I mean, it's it should be, it should be diagnostic laparoscope plus minus operative if there is need. If the patient consent yeah. for this, you yeah. can consent for C and read. Okay. Yeah. And uh, for biopsy, it's, it's, it's without, I mean, biopsy, it's okay. No problem yeah. if we have any suspicion area. So, and then they will check. I uh, usually will use the mini trocar and accessory, at least one accessory trocar because maybe you need to manipulate, uh, I mean, uterus or ovary. But before that, I forget doctors. It's first, uh, this is for the main surgeon, but uh, before that, we should empty the bladder and examination from down because you may, you asked me about that. Examination from down, yes. not only abdominal, also from down and empty the bladder is important. Maybe we'll put that, um, uh, the manipulator for the uterus. Some of them use, some of them they don't use, but you should empty the bladder. Examination BV and empty the bladder, that's important. Yes. So, so now you have uh, uh, inserted the secondary trocar and inserted the laparoscope. What will you do then? So I will inspect the whole abdominal cavity to Very check good. for if there is any, even in the liver, I will check if there is any adhesion between the liver and the anterior abdominal wall. If there is bowel, it's intact, everything is intact. And then I will, uh, the, but during that, I, I will ask the anesthetist to change the position of the, to trim the libric positions during that. So I will shift yeah. the, all the abdomen organ down and, and we can inspect the pelvis. In such condition, when we inspect the pelvis, we'll check the uterus if there is an ovary and tubes and all surrounding area, if, if there is any, uh, I mean, any spot of endometriosis, any adhesion. Uh, yes. 
I will check. Uh, I will check. I mean, the pelvis if there is any. And also, I will check the posterior part of the glottis. We can see it directly by direct vision. Okay. Um. So you are finished with the procedure, right? Yeah. So what are the safety checks to ensure that various needle has been correctly placed? So, yeah, when I check, I check the porous needle, it's, uh, it, it, at first it is pressure. When I introduce the needle at the inside, the pressure, I will check the pressure. If it's less than 10 millimeter mercury, so it's okay. I'm inside the abdominal cavity rather than in the interior abdominal wall. Yes. This is one point. And the second point, it's that's a syringe strange maneuver, I mean a strange technique to uh, to check that it is in intra-abdominal cavity rather than in the abdominal What is it called? The syringe technique? Uh, <laughs> maybe I use this technique. What is strange? Okay. You use a syringe 5 cm, yeah. Yes. Okay. With no, with, uh, first without the uh, normal saline and then we, put, we can put in the uh, normal saline side. Okay. So would you like to discuss the post-operative management of this patient? Surgery is done and now she is in the uh, what, what is the post-operative management? So post-operative management, if it's everything is okay, so it will be, it will be, um, it could be for IV fluid for short situations, not too much yes. because there is no intervention. And mm -hmm. analgesia, if she needs the patient's analgesia is complete, then we could put yes. her an analgesia like non steroidal if near contraindication. For patients, thin patients are easy mobile, so no need for, and we score, I mean, we assess the DV for venous thrombolism, I mean, for DVT, but there is no risk for her because she look, she look, she, if there is no other risk factor, she look low, it may be young age and mobile, probably mobile patients and body weight okay. is not too so much. We will assess the need for thrombolysis. Yeah. yes. Yeah, and um, that's, uh, that's all, yeah. Okay, for her. And is it, okay. Oh. Yeah, debrief the patient after recovery. We'll debrief her patient Is there any red flag signs to be aware of? Mm, so red sign flag because it's low body mass index. Uh, so the uh, needle, a needle insertion should be either use. Uh, you mean post abductor or it's home? Yeah, patient is going home. You would like to uh, okay. tell her about some red yeah, flag yeah, signs yeah, to be yeah, aware yeah. of, yeah, so that she right. can come back. Okay, so on this chart, I will tell her maybe she has some pain. If it's uh, usually within 24 hour pain in the right shoulder or the shoulder, because sometimes the gas, when deflated, the gas not complete, still irritate the phrenic nerve. It could be sometimes yeah. happen. Uh, but if patients complain of uh, abdominal pain or uh, if there is any. Um, yeah, she she can uh, she can call us or contact if it's unusual abdominal pain. It's usually it's simple, but sometimes it may be something hidden. Maybe there is some trauma hidden. It will appear after a few days. Uh, and also, if patients, uh, uh, I mean, if, if normal uh, appetite and normal eating, normal movement, uh, normal urination, everything is okay, so there will be okay. And also, it may be patients complain of um, some discharge from the wound. And usually, it's as for laparoscope, if it's no intervention and no, nothing there, usually some of uh, they don't use prophylactic antibiotics. Some of them, they yes. use only just single injection of antibiotics yeah. for laparoscope. So just take care of the wound. Usually we close the wound uh, from the main trocar if there is more than 10 millimeter uh, size of the skin. And if it's more seven and uh, more than uh, seven um, yeah, and the lateral trocar will close it in order just to avoid the hernia formation. She's thin patient, but still we close the rectus sheath to avoid any hernia formation. If she's complaining of any pain locally, is more than usual, she, she can contact us because we'll give her contact number or she can come back. All right. So thank you so much, Anam, for the station. Uh, very well done. That was a very good attempt. Um, you took 15 minutes, but that's okay because mm -hmm. I had a lot of questions. But all the information that you have given, we need to squeeze it within 10 minutes because all this information is important. Yeah, doctor. Okay. So thanks. we need to tell all this information, but within 10 minutes. So we need to cut some portions. Uh, uh, there should be no probing. So just try to cram the station of laparoscope uh, because these are the, the, the basic points and all that is needed in the exam. They don't uh, want some any uh, like you know uh, expert uh, complications or anything expert opinions. They just need to know about the basis of the laparoscopy. 
So yeah. try to squeeze all these points, and there should be no probing. And then uh, try to uh, squeeze some points like examination. You take a, took a lot of time. Uh, for example, from the abdominal, you can just say that I will perform an abdominal examination and vaginal examination in terms of speculum and a bimanual. So don't need to go into the depth of bimanual. So you can like in this way you can uh, cut some points so that you can squeeze the information in ten minutes. Otherwise, uh, it was a very good presentation. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. For your, uh, my opportunity to give me this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And try to appear in these, uh, you know, practice stations more and more because that gives you some boost um, and gives you some confidence for the exam. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this was a very important and very repetitive exam question. So we will. Um, uh, go to the answers. So the first question was, what further information you would like to know about this patient? So she, since this patient, she's coming with uh, chronic pelvic pain. So in the history of presenting illness, I would like to know about the details of pain. The onset, duration, location, intensity, pattern, aggravating and relieving factors, and any treatment, which Anam has beautifully covered the history. Then you would like to uh, know about the a differential diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain. So uh, any history of uh, uh, dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia. Uh, so with the examiner, you can use all the jargons that you want to use. You can use in the structure discussion because there is no patient. So um, uh, you can uh, use all the uh, you know difficult words uh, or all the medical terminologies. So I would like to rule out uh, endometriosis by asking about the dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia. Uh, I would like to rule out the PID by asking about any uh, lower abnormal pain along with any abnormal vaginal discharge, um, any history of multiple sexual partners. Would like to know about um, uh, BP, uh, uh, bladder pain syndrome and interstitial cystitis by uh, uh, asking about any urinary symptoms that patient might have, any bowel symptoms that patient might have to rule out IBS. And um, I would like to know about uh, her mental history. So, um, Anam has beautifully asked the uh, mental and sexual history by asking about the psychological history and any history of sexual abuse. And I would like to know about uh, sexually transmitted infection. And in asking before asking about uh, the sexually transmitted infections and multiple sexual partner, obviously, uh, it, it is very important to sign post uh, with the patient. Then I would like to know about her last period, uh, her cycle, and uh, any association of pain with the cycle. Okay, so this, this all comes in the menstrual history. Uh, then, um, as she is a pre-op patient, so I would like to know about her cervical screening, um, her contraception. If she is on any um, um, OCPs, they need to be stopped before the uh, before surgery. And would also like to know about her fertility wishes. Then her uh, parity, her mode of delivery, uh, this patient was Nelly Para. Uh, any previous history of uh, medical history, particularly peritonitis and inflammatory bowel disease. So if you, um, uh, if when you are taking the medical history, it will become your targeted history when you ask about peritonitis and IBD. Then the surgical history, any previous history of abdominal surgery, particularly midline incisions midline surgeries and OCP we have uh, stopped four weeks prior then any uh, smoking history because smoking can delay recovery uh, BMI is very important it has been given uh, blood group rule out Jehovah's Witness and family support so a very beautiful history taken by Anam she covered all the points then we came to the examination, vital examination, um, uh, per abdominal and vaginal examination in terms of speculum examination and a biomanual. Uh, then investigations, a urine beta ECG is very important. And it is urine beta ECG is done for all the patients who are appearing uh, uh, for the gynae surgery um, in the reproductive age. And then STI screening is very important. As, um, and in all the chronic pelvic pain patients, uh, according to, you can say that according to RCOG guideline, uh, STI screening is done ultrasound pelvis before um, laparoscopy, and then some pre-op bloods like a blood CP and a group NC. So when the uh, examiner asks you about further information, further information means history, examination, investigation, all of these, not just the history taking. Because information gathering uh, is one um, uh, domain and it covers history, examination, and investigation. So uh, be cautious to cover all three of these. 
then uh, the next question was that what measures will be taken in the preoperative clinic so in the preoperative clinic we will uh, discuss enhanced recovery program with the patient optimize any health or medical condition any medication that she is taking uh, anesthesia fitness will be taken pre op bloods will be done uh, any pre op medications um, will be given vt risk assessment will be done and informed consent will be taken now informed consent here carries the marks in when the examiner asks you what will you do so uh, very beautifully anam uh, uh, said that um, informed consent she didn't forget about the consent which is very important uh, but you have to uh, speak some of the risk uh, some of the risks of the surgery so in the informed consent it will explain the procedure risks and benefits and alternative options see and treat according to the consent this consent will be taken from the patient that if there is any uh, pathology that can be treated as well uh, then some of the serious risks are injury to the bladder bowel vasculature uh, failure to gain entry into the abdominal cavity hernia scar site vt and death uh, the frequent risks are bruising shoulder to pain wound infection and any extra procedure that might be done might require to be done repair of uh, damage for example visceral damage um, bl bladder bowel and blood transfusion so this is basically the consent from the rcog consent advice and uh, in one third we can also counsel the patient at this point that one in one third of the cases no cause is found for uh, chronic pelvic pain uh, then uh, next question was that what measures will you take just before the surgery so who safety checklist this so when, whenever the examiner asks the question just before the surgery so just imagine what you routinely do in the uh, in the theater just before performing the laparoscopy we all what we all do is that we all do a surgical safety checklist okay so that is the first thing first in the patient safety point so um uh, anam said it but i think she said it in the um, in the pre op clinic that's also fine but um, safety checklist um, you can also you should also say just before the surgery and um, we will make sure that the consent has been taken that is also included in this safety checklist will uh, um, position the patient so position is initially horizontal supine with slight flexion and this horizontal is position is for the port insertion once pneumoperitoneum and port insertion is done then we will do the lloyd davis position uh, in which there is slight hip flexion 15 degrees and the head end is tilted 30 degrees downwards for exposing the pelvis by allowing the uh, bowel loops to following okay and then we will inform the consultant the palpate the abdomen for any masses position of aorta and ensure that the stomach is empty and if you are going for palmer's point entry ensure that the spleen is not palpable so this is also one of the patient safety point um then we will clean the abdomen vulva vagina and clean and rape uh, perform a uh, empty the bladder in uh, perform a biomanual examination and insert the uterine uh, manipulator so this uh, has to be the sequence uh, this is what we no routinely do so first of all we will empty the bladder we will perform the biomanual examination then we will insert the uterine manipulator we will attach the light cable and check white balance then we will check the gas flow and set the pressure to cut off of 20 to 25 mm of mercury with high flow then we will make sure that the diathermy plate is correctly attached okay so these are the uh, steps which needs to be taken just before the surgery now examiner will ask you that how will you proceed with the laparoscopy considering the risk factor so um anam said that um we can either choose the because she is a low bmi that is the risk factor so she rightly said that we will either go for a palmer's point entry or, or open hassens technique so in the palmer's point entry will um, the closed entry technique uh, is done before inserting the primary trocar uh, the abdomen needs to be descended with co2 gas and this is achieved with very needle very needle should be sharp with a good and tested spring action and a disposable needle is recommended why because it fulfill the criteria of uh, this criteria of uh, the sharp needle with good and tested spring action then considering the low bmi what uh, most of the student make mistake is that they they start with the uh, umbilical incision even if the patient is low bmi so make sure that although we routinely do uh, um, that, that that is the classic you know what is you routinely done the umbilical entry but be aware that whenever there is low bmi you have to go for the palmer's point entry at this point so considering the low bmi in order to reduce the risk of vascular injury the primary incision will be given at the palmer's point 
so uh, which is three centimeter below the left costal margin in the mid clavicular line. Uh, even if examiner doesn't ask you, uh, it's it is important that you will explain that what is palmer's point because they expect you, they want you to say these words out loud. And then care should be taken not to incise too deeply as to enter the peritoneal cavity. Okay. Um, uh, then uh, this is just the abdominal incision. Okay, so this incision should not be deep. This is should this incision should be just should be skin deep incision. Then abdominal wall is stabilized and various needle is inserted at right angle to the skin. It is pushed in sufficiently to penetrate the fascia and peritoneum, but not further. So this is another patient safety point that do not push it too um, too much inside so as to enter the viscera or damage anything just enter the fascia and peritoneum and when you do this you will hear two two audible clicks are heard then another safety point is that uh, excessive lateral movement of the needle is avoided at this point when you have inserted a needle do not move it as this may convert a needle point injury in a um, in wall of bowel or vessel into a more complex tear now uh, we would like to know about the correct position of needle there was another next question in which the examiner asked again about the um, different the different test to check the needle safety so even if you have said it in the procedure portion you can question you can um, you have to if the examiner has asked it separately then you have to repeat it in the next question as well so correct position of needle is checked with an initial insufflation pressure of less than 8 millimeter of mercury. Even 10 millimeter of mercury, is, as Anam said, is, that is fine. Less than 10 millimeter of mercury is fine. And the gas flow is free flowing at one liter per minute. Then another test is Palmer's test in which uh, we take some saline, some like 5 cc saline. And they will, then first of all, we will attach it to the various needle, we aspirate it to make sure that there is nothing coming like any bowel content or any blood. And then we'll um, uh, inject some drops of saline and uh, drops of saline should not be aspirated back. So that will make sure that the various needle is within the peritoneal cavity or, and not in the preperitoneum or in the abdominal wall. Because if it is in the abdominal wall, uh, what will happen? That it will, in the re-aspiration, it will come back. It will not be uh, go down into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, according to the uh, Anam, it is very important that in in some uh, in all the structure discussions, make a habit that you give some reference, like some evidence based reference. Try to say that uh, according to the RCOG guideline, an intrabromal pressure of twenty to twenty five millimeter mercury is used for gas insufflation before inserting the primary trocar. And however, the distension pressure can be reduced to twelve to 20, uh, twelve to fifteen. So this is a mistake. Twelve to fifteen. Once the insertion of primary trocar is complete. So this gives adequate distension for the operative laparoscopy and allows the anesthetist to ventilate the patient safely and effectively. Okay, and then comes the insertion of the, so the um, abdomen is distended. Now what happens? You will insert the primary trocar. It should be inserted in a controlled manner at 90 degrees to the skin. And insertion should be stopped immediately once the trocar is inside the abdominal cavity and not any further so as to avoid injury to the blood vessels and viscera. Uh, a two to five, then we uh, once the trocar is inserted, you will remove the trocar and then uh, cannula will stay there. And in the cannula, you will insert the laparoscope. Two to five millimeter laparoscope is used to inspect the undersurface of an interior abdominal wall in the area beneath the umbilicus. So uh, what you have done that you have introduced a, a five mm laparoscope through the palmer's point. Now what you are doing that you will um, see the uh, uh once you will do it you can uh, uh for the first thing you have to do is to uh, do the 360 degree view also what you have to do is to see the area beneath the umbilicus because that is the most convenient one to do any uh, you know operative procedure or anything any c and treat procedures so you can also if the, that area is free of adhesions and, and you are comfortable in using that you can uh, uh, uh if that is the area is free then trocar and kerula is in, inserted so once the laparoscope is in, introduced, then you will do, uh, it will be rotated 360 degrees to check visually for any adherent bowel. If there is concern that bowel may be adherent or adhesions are present, then primary uh, trocar should be visualized from a second report site with a 5 mm scope. So uh, uh, Palmer's point was, we, are, uh, we have already said that three centimeters below the left costal margin in the middle clavicular line, 
um for bmis which are high high bmis and low bmis you can use the palmer's point also if there is a history of peritonitis ibd previous midline surgery in all these patient palmer's point uh, entry is advisable uh, but mm, make sure to rule out surgery in this area and splenomegaly uh, and an empty stomach should be there as well so uh, then uh, uh, we have inserted the primary port now we'll insert the secondary port it must be inserted under direct vision the primary port was not inserted under direct vision but the secondary port has to be inserted under direct vision perpendicular to the skin and uh, the pneumoperitoneum should still be 20 to 25 mm of mercury and a very important point is to um, make sure that a direct vision of inferior epigastric vessel should be visualized laparoscopically to ensure that the intu point is far away from the vessel once the tip of trocar has pierced the peritoneum, it should be angled towards the interior pelvis under careful visual control until the sharp tip has been removed. Uh, so here, this is, here is the uterus. This is the round ligament, and this uh, a point. This is the obliterated, obliterated umbilical vessels, and the inferior epigastric vessels. These are lateral to it. Okay, so try to uh, uh, you will have to directly visualize this and avoid this for the insertion of secondary port. Uh, the other technique which can be used with low BMIs is open or hessian technique. In this technique, a mini laparotomy incision is made first below the umbilicus. Uh, a blunt and trocar is inserted by directly visualizing the bowel or momentum into the cavity. Once the facial edges are incised, these are held with the lateral stay sutures on either side, and these are pulled firmly to produce an airtight seal with the cannula. And what happens that in the open technique, the gas is insufflated directly through the cannula to produce pneumoperitone. In the closed technique, we introduce the gas insufflated through, uh, through the varicose needle, but here we are directly insufflating through the cannula. And then there are other techniques like direct trocar insertions. These can also be done. So we did a, system, a systematic inspection of the pelvis, uterus, and next are uterovaginal fold, pouch of Douglas, uterosecular ligaments, peritoneal side walls, ovarian fossa, upper abdomen, a uh, procedure was done according to the consent. Any biopsy of the individual spots can be taken with the correct labeling as sent for histopathology. Um, then uh, for closure, secondary port, ports must be removed under direct vision to ensure that any hemorrhage can be observed and treated if, if present. Um, laparoscope should be used to check that there has not been a through and through injury of the bowel adherent under umbilicus by visual control during removal. Uh, now, the uh, removal of uh, primary port, this is the last step. So, uh, another patient is if you point is the open the valve and allows you to, to escape, then withdraw the port with the valve still open. Valve should be still open. Why? To minimize the risk of bowel or momentum being sucked into it in the end of the procedure. And uh, any then we now we have removed the ports. We'll try to remove as much as gas from the abdomen as we can because later on it can cause shoulder tip pain. And then any non midline ports uh, over seven mm, and any midline port of greater than ten mm, uh, they need a formal sheet closure uh, to avoid port site hernia. Uh, now we have got we'll close the skin the skin incision with vicar repeat, do the aseptic dressing, and now we'll um, do our documentation. Uh, Post-operatively, what you will do is follow enhanced recovery program, monitor the patient's vitals, assess the need for thromboprophylaxis, give pain relief. If the criteria is met, she can go home the same day with the follow-up schedule in the clinic at four weeks' time to discuss the findings. Uh, debrief the patient about surgical findings and provide a patient information leaflet. Providing a patient information leaflet is also a patient safety point. Uh, then uh, for endometriosis, post-operatively hormone treatment can be given to reduce post-op pain according to SG guideline. Okay. And uh, then the next question was, is there any red flag signs? So the red flag signs are um, whenever the patient is going home at discharge, you will tell her that if you have any abdominal pain, you are spiking any temperatures or you have any vomiting, uh, then you should come back to us. Uh, because... Uh, that can be indicative of bowel or bladder injury. A painful, ho hot, swollen leg and difficulty bearing weight on the leg can be DVT. Shortness of breath and chest pain can be because of uh, permanent embolism. Burning or stinging in urine and increased frequency can be because of UTI. And painful rest scar can be uh, because of wound infection. So these uh, symptoms of red flag signs, symptoms and signs of red, uh, red flag signs, the, you have to um, tell the patient these. Okay, uh, this is also from the RCUG patient information leaflet. 
Um, so uh, how, uh, how do we have any questions? Are we clear up to this point? So from the guideline, um, most common injuries that of the bowel, 0.6 per thousand. Urinary tract injuries are 0.3 per thousand. Vascular injury risk is 0.1 per thousand. This is just some of the general knowledge which you may want to know. Um, if the BMI is increased or BMI is low, then we go for Hassan's and Palmer's point. If there's a previous midline surgery, we will go for the Palmer's point because that has the lowest risk of adhesions. Uh, Hassan's te technique has not shown uh, evidence that it reduces the injury to the bowel, but it may reduce injury to the vessel in thin woman. So these are also from the RCG guideline. Then there is a, a type one injury. Type one injury in those in those patients who has anatomically normal abdomen. And type two injury where there has been previously any abdominal surgery, uh, so any pathology there can be type two injury. Type two injury happens when the bowel is attached to the anterior abdominal wall. So you can uh, prevent type two injuries um, by taking the history of the patient because you will know about any previous surgery and then you will avoid this site. For example, it is umbilical site, then you will avoid it. You will go for the palmer's point. But for the type one injuries, you have to take all the safety uh, or the patient safety points that we have discussed in the procedure. Okay, so do we have any questions? That was all about the station of the laparoscopy. That has repeatedly come in the exam. So communication with colleagues, informing the consultant, clear and concise communication. Uh, demonstrate awareness, understanding, and importance of shared decision making. Applied clinical knowledge was evidence based clinical knowledge. Uh, the entry techniques, correct insufflation and maintenance uh, operating press pressures. Demonstrating a safe technique of port insertion. Explain the risks of surgery. And then um, information gathering should be focused, relevant information, and uh, obtain a, a relevant past medical his surgical history as well. Patient safety points are WHO safety checklist. Uh, different entry techniques, uh, discuss the consent process and patient information leaflet on serious and re frequent risk, discuss the possible complications and which measures can be taken to reduce them, uh, involving the consultant and the safety checks uh, for the various needle insertion. So um, how was the station, Anam? You covered almost all the points of uh, patient safety information gathering, applied clinical knowledge. Is, is there a possible that maybe if we have Viva, it maybe they will ask about uh, trauma during laparoscopy? Uh, please come back again. Yeah, is there is possible if, in case of Viva, is there is any possibility that they will ask about the trauma during laparoscopy? Trauma? Yeah, yeah, like bowel trauma. Any injury, you mean? Yeah. No. So this station was very straightforward. But you have to know, because all these points carried marks. You see the, 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 the WHO safety ch ch checklist, the entry points, the safety checks, all these carried marks. So uh, th this was a station about basic laparoscopy. This was not about the complication. Um, the complication stations, they usually come as an SPT, where there is, you, you know, bowel injury, ureteric injury. So those will be the, the SPT stations. And you can also handle, th those stations can be very difficult and very easy as well if you know uh, the um, if you can grasp you know the risk management then you it will be very easy for you to do those stations because all you have to do is to settle the patient and uh, there's nothing much in the management that you can do you have to say that i'll do some initial management and then some sub sub subsequent management in which uh, i'll Calling the consultant, um, a team of doctors, which will include the surgeon anesthetist, um, um, the um, uh, gynecologist, and then uh, rectify any damage which has been done. So they are not going to ask you different methods of bowel repair or, you know, uh, different methods of ureteric repair. They are not going to ask any of that. Okay. Yes. Hello, doctor. I am Rekha. Can I ask you one? Rekha, can you? Your voice is very low. Can you? Uh... Uh, can you 
hear me now yes i can hear you now okay uh, in one of the uh, exams there was one it was online there was mm -hmm. one picture they showed that um, there will be an in, uh, trocar injury to the uh, uterus by mm -hmm. inserting the trocar so then they asked uh, how will you manage you will be an st5 so what will you do how will you manage further so then yes. how we'll have to go about for that yes so uh, for any visceral injury if it is a bowel injury you have to call the surgeons you all, always try to do you know multidisciplinary approach so uh, if it is a, a ureteric injury you will inform the anesthetist you will inform the uh, theater nurse uh, inform the anesthetist that an uh, an injury has been happened uh, the anesthetist will give antibiotics uh, they will try to be cautious about her uh, vitals and uh, inform them that we there might be a need to convert this procedure to an open laparotomy inform the theater nurse because uh, this is you know this is a trick to tackle all these patients with any uh, complications that might happen you will inform the theater nurse to to um, uh, take out the laparotomy trolley or the laparotomy set uh informed the uh, um uh, ward nurse to because the rest of the procedures might be cancelled on the list because obviously mm -hmm. the uh, patient will take more time mm -hmm. then you will um uh, for um, if the uh, if it is ureteric injury you will inform your consultant and you will consultant will come and manage with you otherwise if it is a bowel injury you will inform the um, uh, the surgeons colorectal surgeons for ureteric injury uh, urologist um, and then what will happen that for example uh, we are now talking about the ure, uh, ure, ure, uterine injury so just try to manage it just like uh, a uterine perforation injury so what you will do is that do all these measures and then careful carefully uh, visualize um and keep keep a keen eye on the injury if it is a small injury very small injury you can you know uh, uh, treat it with diathermy hmm. right otherwise if it is a uh, if it is actively bleeding then you may want to take some sutures laparoscopically hmm. right and if uh, even if the uh, there can be the worst scenario is the bleeding is not controlled the patient is bleeding heavily and her vitals are dropping and you know she is going into uh, she has uh, lost a lot of um, <clears throat> um uh, there is a lot of hemoperitoneum then obviously you will have to go for the you are not able to tra tackle it with the laparoscopic uh, sutures so in the end you will what you will do that you will open the abdomen and you, you will do the laparotomy so you, you know just try to uh, what, what we routinely do in our theaters this uh, this is all about that yeah okay okay doctor thank you yeah and then um, obviously because uh, in the extra procedure um, you can also add the uh, extra procedure is repair of visra and also if there is repair of visra then uh, or if there is injury to a uterus a bowel bladder blood vessels there will be ob obviously there will be an open laparotomy procedure uh so uh, in all the patient we, we in our training we used to you know take a history of the um in the in our pre op clinics we used to uh, in the consent we used to take the history of open laparotomy from all the patients so just the routine things that we do for um a uterine perforation the same the same things you will follow here and uh, post procedure uh, we have to mention also about that about explaining yeah. duty of yeah, candor very important all. very mm. important because uh, documentation during after a surgical procedure then debriefing the patient performing the duty of control raising an incident report um or uh, addressing all these risk management issues and obviously then the patient hospital stay will be prolonged so all these needs to be you know discussed dr leena incidents report in case we open laparotomy or just the trauma and the manage uh, manage at the same of the laparoscope is there any need for incidents report in such condition any There's any any procedure which has not been like any complication if it has happened then you need to you need to raise an incident report but because we already we patient was um, i mean was signed for consent written consent if there is any complication but which type of complication that will write incident report i think incident report big problem dilemma in uk you see in the in the consent you even signed for uh, asked her uh, and told her about vt and even you t told her about death 
so it is not about that we have told her in the in consent we tell them about everything but if a complication happens on the safe side you can say that i will raise an incident report there is no harm uh, because you don't know how much was the injury to the uterus if it was small or it was big so on the safe side just say that i will raise an incident report and uh, depending upon the injury if it is a small we can use a diathermy if it is uh, if it is not controlled we can take some sutures yeah. if still not controlled we will have to do the open laparotomy and uh, perform uh, repair it lap uh, in the open surgery yeah i think yeah okay the protocol with maybe it's in a certain part yeah you're right okay so for the november exam the candidates who are going to appear it will, um on the rcg website it says that it will be from the 6 to 10th november um the deadline for assessment of training is 13th july for the exam i will uh, go a little a bit about uh, go through about how we are going to prepare from now onwards so for the november candidates you need to make a realistic timetable and you'll have to stick to it okay and uh, practice practicing with the study buddy is very important because this exam is all about practice mm, in the last two three months you will have to practice every day but make sure that you practice during this time as well make sure that you have gone through all the station with your study buddy so that they can you know pick out your mistakes within, within every station stay motivated but allow time uh, for relaxation as well assemble your study material so for study material is all the patient information leaflet executive summaries of rcg nice fsrs guidelines consent advices uh, uh, important talk articles which are not covered in the guidelines this some revision books are um, they help you and they guide you about the exam as well oxford is very good get through tony lisa joel just in konje try to uh, do as much as you can so whenever you are st uh, uh, studying uh, start module wise study for example um, you are doing the uh, early pregnancy module so try to do all the uh, guidelines then read all the patient information leaflets and try to do the uh, it's re uh, the stations from the books as well so th that is how you can you know do um, every module okay so it is very likely to have one station in the exam that doesn't go well but you can still pass the exam in, even if you perform poorly in one or two stations so it is very important that you once if if there is a station which went very badly just try to forget about this station because even in in the oslers or in the um, you know life uh, exam face to face exam uh, even if you perform very poorly in one station you in the next station the you will have to you know just try to forget about everything that has happened nikal dete and how this, the chances of this can be reduced by practicing more and more uh, in the night before the exam stop studying relax and sleep well uh, during the exam read the question very carefully and see which domains which domains you are being tested for and what the likely diagnosis may be so whenever the candidates instructions come in front of you the first thing that you will see is what domains you are being tested for uh, sometimes you uh, like you know there are four five, four domains that you will be tested for maybe the information gathering is not there but you are still you know in, in your habit you have started taking the history and all that so uh, and that doesn't carry any marks so very important to um, see which domains you are being tested for and uh, just try to make a, a diagnosis in your mind that what is this station about uh, introduction then comes interaction with the patient and introduction should be very clear and confident and well practiced uh, make some lines for introduction and try to practice them and um, with in like you know everyday practice try to rehearse them back and back um then the history take there should be a set pattern of history taking write down a, a pattern of history taking which you are going to follow and stick to that pa pattern because it the, you are not going to change this pattern during the exam it should not be made up just on the on the spot 
So make sure that you have a pattern and stick to it so that you will not skip any points. Uh, the history taking should be followed by examination and in investigation. As I said in today's um, structure discussion, that when examiner asks you about the information gathering, you have to, you know, take history, do examination, and then investigation as well. So everything is covered in the information gathering. Uh, if investigations are given, very important to co confirm the patient's name and NHS number, explain the condition, then explain the management pl plan, uh, give the patient the follow up. Uh, give her a patient information leaflet and then write back to the GP. So these are some of the basic points. If you start preparing from today and start practicing from today, then um, try to make sure that you uh, you um, you don't do not miss out on these points because these are the basic points. You should not be you know missing out on these basic things. Then uh, listen to the patient, patient for patient communication. Listening to the patient attentively is very important. If patient is saying something, do not interrupt the patient. Let her speak. And uh, if you, if there's something that you do not know about, be honest and do not hesitate to admit that you do not know about this. However, you will, you know, get information and get back to the patient on this. Uh, acknowledging the patient's um, uh, history or whatever she's saying by maintaining an eye contact nodding or saying words like mm -hmm, yeah i see so you know these things are very important as you saw in today's structure discussion even when anam was you know saying the um, uh, answering the questions i was i kept on you know responding to her so that to make sure that i have engaged her and that she's you know not talking to any dummy or anything um, then provide the information in chunks do not give all the information all at once to the patient for example, if you have taken history, after history taking, take a small, you know, uh, take a pause and ask the patient that, um, is there anything that you would like to add to this, his, this history? After examination, investigation, take it another, you know, uh, if when you have explained the condition, take another uh, gap and say that, um, have I expla explained it well to you? Am I being clear so far? So checking the patient understanding is very important. Never end a station with a simulated patient without asking whether there are any questions. So in the exam, you will see that whenever you ask the patient at towards the end of the station that have I answered all your queries, she will come up with something. And if you answer that thing, then you will, you know, uh, you will be scored for that, uh, that particular uh, thing. So it is very important to make sure that the consultation is complete. The patient has, uh, you know, uh, if she has any questions or any expectations from the uh, consultation that has been answered. So now we'll go through uh, each of the domains that how, what things are covered in these domains in the exam. So in the exam, the information gathered, it covers a focused detailed history. Do not try to, you know, ask everything. When uh, students, they try to follow the pattern uh, with the set pattern, which they have, you know, crammed up. They try to ask everything from the, uh, from the patient. So don't do that. For example, if there is a maternal medicine stations, a uh, student might be asking about, you know, her, um, uh, her, her sexual history, the details of the sexual history. There's no need to ask about that. Just, you know, uh, try to be focused. And then uh, examination, this is also in, uh, included in information gathering. Interpretation of results is also included. And then ordering investigations or in test. Recovering or reviewing information from the records in the same of other hospital. For example, uh, in the surgical module, you uh, when you ask the patient that you uh, would like to know about the previous surgery, you would like to review the notes from the previous surgery or, or the surgery that has been performed. So that is included in the information gathering. And then encouraging questions and offering timely and rational answers. So this is all included in the information gathering. The next, next domain is communication with the patients and relatives. So in this domain, history taking is also included. And then uh, discussing uh, the diagnosis. When we are explaining the condition to the patient, that is uh, included in the communication. Uh, any results that has been uh, given, communicating that to the patient. Breaking bad news. So in these stations, of surgical module, uh, breaking bad news will come across uh, multiple times and that is included in the communication. Because the patient is going to be very angry, a complication has happened and how you are going to tackle the patient, that is the essence of the station. 
and knowing when, where, and what and how to and not to communicate. Uh, dealing with a teenager or patients that lack the capacity, that is also included here. Dealing with angry patient and relatives. Uh, demonstrating how to check understanding and encouraging questions, providing appropriate answers. These are all the uh, communication with patient and relatives points. So, uh, who is on mute? Can you please mute your mic? Okay, I think it has been muted. So next domain is communication with colleagues. So um, for example, it is a teaching module. There will be a junior colleague. There can be nurses, midwives, medical students. Um, when you say that I'll write back to your GP towards the end of the station, so you are marked for the communication with colleagues. Um, for ex in the um, um, structured discussion station, some of some of the times you have to, you know, um, uh, hand or give the when the uh, examiner asks that uh, any extra information you would like to know about this patient. For example, in emergency situation, then you will use the SBAR tool in which you will uh, give the handover in situation background assessment and recommendations tool. Um, uh, when you say that we will be, you know, a team of doctors will be looking after you, that is MDT. So uh, knowing what the composition of MDT me, me, uh, team should be, it is very important to say that team of doctors, which will include an, uh, a sleep doctor, um, the, um, my consultant, the bowel doctor, bowel surgeons, or for example, if urologist, so bladder surgeons, this and that. You, so you have to name these MDT team members. So uh, uh, this this is a very you know uh, easy more domain to pass because once you have said MDT or team of doctors then you you know you are take pass for this domain uh, sharing information with patients GPs midwives other healthcare providers when to call for help this is also included in communication with colleagues then the next domain patient safety this is uh, the most important domain of all the domains patient safety is the most important. So whenever, whenever you are covering a station, try not to miss out on the patient's safety. Make sure that you do not miss out. Uh, what will cover? Uh, what will be covered in patient safety is issues on data protection, mental capacity act, child protection. When the candidates uh, they have to call for help, issues of confidentiality. For example, um, any like you know uh, sexually shared infection in HIV patients, you have to maintain confidentiality. Um, in the sexual assault patient, you have to maintain confidentiality. So these are some of the test stations. If the patient is coming for emergency contraception, um, she is a young patient, then you have to, you know, maintain confidentiality in these type of stations. Cultural and religious factors involving care. This is also important in the patient safety. Uh, audit and clinical governance. So clinical governance um, uh, is, is very important in the surgical module. Um, in all the complication stations, you will have to address the components of clinical governance, uh, raising an incident reporting, performing the duty of control. So all these. WHO safety checklist as well is covered here in the surgical module, safe prescription and prescribing errors. So uh, the, the, this is also included in patient safety. Confirming that the result belong to the patient. As I said that uh, you will have to confirm the patient's name and NHS number. So that will be included in the patient safety. Some unlicensed medication which you are giving, for example, acyclovir, although it is unlicensed, but it is given, also is unlicensed. So you need to know about these things. Ensuring that the patient's health is not jeopardized, contraindication to the management, complications arising from treatment or failure to treat, consenting for surgery, who, what, and when to consent, prioritization of care, for example, inpatient, outpatient, labor work prioritization, waiting list prioritization. Um, so these are the, these also comes under patient safety. Thromboprophylaxis, antibiotic prophylaxis, drug allergies. So in every station, try to make sure that you do not miss out on these very important points. Then come the applied uh, clinical knowledge bit, which we all know that um, this is the evidence-based practice. All everything which is mentioned in the guidelines, uh, all the management points, this will be included in the uh, uh, applied clinical knowledge um, domain. Uh, you'll have to have familiarity with the current literature and guidelines, able to demonstrate the use of guidelines, uh, pro uh, protocols to make decisions about the care of patients. 
so um, this is all uh, the information for the november uh, candidates um for those who are appearing in the november uh, med exam will first of all uh, they will we, will we are starting um, a regular course in which we'll start from the very basics and uh, take you through all the modules uh, step by step and um, our senior mentors like dr um Hassan and Dr. Zeb will be conducting it. Um, Dr. Uzma will be there as well. And then we'll run another course that will be uh, a fast track or a crash course. Um, uh, and in the uh, in the crash course, obviously it will be close to the exam. So in the crash course, we'll be doing all the, uh, try to repeat all the um, uh, important stations, which might come in the exam. And, um, try to cover this all the important bits in all the last you know uh, two months so um, i recommend you all to take a course uh, because uh, it is important in the in the part three exam is very important to be you know um, get organized and try to have an exam buddy and uh, start practice practicing from the you know from now onwards so that you will be um, um if even if you are giving um one one to two hours every one day or every second day that's fine but in close to the exam two or three months before um, before the exam you'll have to practice every day so someone was asking for the first slide Niveen Sharaf Niveen when are you appearing for the exam I think she is on mute mode. So that is all that we wanted to talk about in today's session. I hope you found it helpful, the laparoscopy station, and that you, whenever it comes in the exam, whether MRCPI or MRCOG, you will not be blank and you will be, um, you know, able to do it in a systematic way. Uh, Anam has beautifully covered all the points, but I would like to tell her to be, you know, more organized and try to cover everything within the 10 minutes because uh, time is also very important and of the essence. And um, so that's all for today's session. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you so much all of you for uh, joining us for today's session. You are very welcome Rekha. Uh, Hello, Doctor. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you all for joining us for this uh, free webinar. They're asking about uh, electrosurgeries uh, recently. So about that, you want, you will do any uh, session? About diathermy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, diathermy is a very important station. It has actually recently come an exam. And it keeps on coming, you know, it's one of the repetitive exam stations. So, um, uh, yes, sure. Uh, is this Rekha? Yes, yes. So, Rekha, have you joined? Any, uh, when are you appearing? I am planning for November. MRCOG, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, do you plan to take any course or anything? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I want. I think I have to take. Otherwise, it will be difficult <laughs> if we are studying yeah. alone. So, um, uh, we will be conducting one. You know, um, uh, um, the in the crash course definitely we will cover all the exam stations or all the important stations. So I know mm -hmm. that this is one of the exam stations. So we will be definitely covering it in the in the crash course. So you can, uh, you know, um, okay. We will be definitely covering it, and uh, we will, you know, try to make it easy to be you know in the structure discussion mostly it is viva so we are all familiar with this mode of you know exam in which you have to examine and ask the question and you just you know <laughs> it is like you know uh, whatever you have crammed up uh, from previous uh, previously then you, you just have to say all this those bits so um, laparoscopy diathermy enhanced recovery program these are all the you know um, this is more of uh, a rote learning thing anyhow we'll cover it and we'll make you know um uh the material will be uh, favorable and easy to remember 
and easy to reproduce in the exam. Okay. 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 Thank you, doctor. You're very welcome, Roshna. You are very welcome, and uh, thank you as well for joining us. So uh, that's all for today's session. Uh, we will stay in touch from the med exam um, uh, portal and uh, we'll uh, keep on um, we have actually made a whatsapp group for the november candidates and uh, we'll try to stay active on that as well and um, inshallah we will uh, we are, the med exam is running um, uh, um, you know a, a routine course and then a fast track crash course as well so um, we will uh, meet you there on the course and uh, try to polish your uh, skills. Um, until that time, um, I would like to thank you all again and I'll see you later on in one of the courses. Thank you so much and bye-bye and good night from my side.